Today's story, The Mary Celeste, is written by Jane Yoland and Heidi Elizabeth Yoland Stemple, illustrated by Roger Roth. When I grow up, I want to be a detective, just like my dad. He says I was born curious, which is just what a detective needs to be. What I'm most curious about now is my father's file of old mysteries that have never been solved. They have baffled people for years. Dad calls these cases open but I call them History Mysteries, and I am determined to figure them out. For each mystery, I read as much as I can about it. I keep a notebook in which I highlight the most important clues. Sometimes I draw a map and a timeline. and I always keep a list of important words that are special to the case to help me understand what has happened. The Mary Celeste is about a ship whose crew disappeared when they were on the high seas more than 120 years ago. The crew was never found, though lots of people have ideas or theories about what might have happened. No one is sure. But Dad says no mystery is impossible to solve as long as you have enough clues. This is how the story goes. A brisk December wind filled the great sails of the De Gratia. She had left New York on November 15th 1872 to cross the cold Atlantic with a cargo of petroleum. It was a long trip, many days on an empty ocean and nothing to look at but the thin line between sea and sky. Early in the afternoon of December 4th, December 5th in sea time, Seaman John Johnson, alerted the wheel, spotted a smudge on the horizon. He called out excitedly, Captain Morehouse, sir, there's something coming toward us off the port bow. De gratia is Latin for, by the grace of God. The ship was a Nova Scotian brigantine owned by George F. Miller of Bear River, Nova Scotia. Its captain was David Reed Morehouse. Petroleum. Crude oil before it has been refined for use. Seaman. Sailor. Sea time. Sea time and shore time are measured 12 hours apart because sea time is counted from noon 
when the sun stands directly overhead. Port. The left side of the ship. Starboard is the right side of a ship. Bow. The forward part of a ship. Stern is the rear part of a ship. Captain Morehouse looked through his spyglass. Even though the smudge was miles away, he could tell it was a ship heading in their direction. But as she came closer, he saw that the ship moved slowly, oddly, running aimlessly before the wind. Only three sails were still set. Two had been blown away, and one was lying loose. The rest of the sails were furled. Several of the De Gracia's crew gathered at the rail to watch the oncoming brig. They all knew something was wrong. When sailors see a ship sailing toward them, they can tell by the way she is moving whether something is wrong. If she yaws badly, swinging erratically to the right or left, sailors can easily see there is a problem, even from far away. They can also note if the sails are properly trimmed for the amount of wind that is blowing. Spyglass a handheld telescope. Furled. Something rolled up or fastened like a sail. Brig. short for Brigantine, a two-masted ship. Get me to Vaux, ordered the captain. A seaman went below deck to rouse the first mate from his berth. By the time DeVoe joined the captain, the other ship was near. Look, Morehouse said, handing the mate the spyglass. But, he said, they fly no flag of distress. Perhaps they lie drunken below? At the wheel, Johnson laughed. They wouldn't if they had a captain like ours. Captain Morehouse laughed too, then said, let us hail them. They ran up the flags that offered help. Minutes went by, and they got no reply. When they sailed closer still, the captain called out through his speaking trumpet. He was greeted by a strange silence. There is an entire alphabet of international signal flags. At that time, P over C, flown together from the masthead, the top part of the mast, meant crew have mutinied. N over D meant I must abandon my vessel. First mate. The second in command after the captain. Berth. 
A Sailor's Sleeping Quarters. Hail, to call a greeting to a passing ship. Speaking Trumpet, a device like a megaphone used to make a voice louder. Mutiny. When a ship's crew revolts against the captain, usually killing him and taking over the ship. Something is definitely amiss, the captain said. Someone must go over and see. So a small boat was lowered. Three of the sailors, DeVoe, Johnson, and second mate John Wright, rode across to the silent brig. The ship was a bit over a hundred feet in length, with an ornamental scroll on her bow. What is she called? asked Johnson. He was pulling on the oars and so could not see. The Mary Celeste out of New York, said DeVoe, reading the name on her stern. The only sounds were their own voices and the slip-slap of the waves. From the Mary Celeste there was silence. Some people believe the Mary Celeste had a cursed history. She was built in 1860, originally called Amazon. Her captain, Robert McClellan, took ill and died on her very first voyage. In 1867, she ran ashore in Cape Braden and had to be repaired. In 1868, she was sold to an American and given a new name, Mary Celeste, possibly as a superstitious way to avoid more tragedy. The Mary Celeste left Pier 44 on New York City's East River on Tuesday, November 5th. Because of bad weather, she anchored about a mile down the harbor, offshore. As soon as the weather cleared, she set sail again on November 7th with a light and favorable wind. When next seen on December 4th, December 5th sea time, she was 600 miles west of Portugal. Second mate, the officer who is next in rank below the first mate. DeVoe and Wright clambered on board, leaving Seaman Johnson behind. Slowly they searched from bow to stern, but there was no one up on the deck, not even at the ship's wheel. The wheel was neither damaged nor lashed to a single course. The lifeboat that should have been lying across the main hatch was missing.
Wright and DeVoe checked the ship's pumps, which turned out to be in good working order. And besides, there was little water in the hold. Mutiny, whispered Wright, as if afraid to say the word aloud. Or a fever ship? Maybe pirates, DeVoe whispered back. Let's go on. What would the ship have looked like if the crew had left willingly? Tidy cabins, all navigational aids taken with them, foodstuffs taken as well. The hatches, doors, properly closed, and the wheel tied to a specific course. If pirates had attacked them, Shattered railings, broken doors, smashed cabins indicating fighting, gashes in wood from sword or pistol fights. In fact, when the Mary Celeste's crew disappeared, there were no longer pirates sailing the Atlantic. The last of them had been seen in the 1830s. Mutinies, though rare, had happened as recently as 1857 on the schooner Walter M. Togood. Deserted or lost ships were not rare. Some recent ones of note, the French ship Rosalie in 1840, the Spanish ship Viego in 1868. Main hatch. The largest or most used opening in the deck of a ship. Ships pumps. Machines for removing excess water in the ship's hold. Fever ship, a ship on which the crew have all taken ill or died from a disease, perhaps yellow fever or cholera. The captain's cabin sat neat and ship shape, except that the bed had not yet been made. The print of a small body was on the covers, and several toys lay scattered on the floor. An old dress hung near the bed, some Indian rubber overshoes standing under it. In the water closet sat a bag of dirty clothing. A rosewood harmonium stood silent against one wall, above it a shelf of music books. The captain of the Mary Celeste had brought his family with him and many of the comforts of home. In the first mate's cabin, the ship's log lay open, the last entry dated 8 a.m. November 25th. No trouble had been noted up to that time. The captain would have been extra careful in choosing the crew with his wife and baby daughter aboard. That crew consisted of first mate Albert Richardson,
second mate, Andrew Gilling, Stewart and Cook, Edward William Head, and four German seamen, two of them brothers, seven in total. They all had reputations as first-class sailors. Mrs. Briggs wrote to her mother, though the captain thought the crew, a pretty peaceable set this time all around, if they continue as they had begun. Can't tell yet how smart they are. Water closet. The ship's toilet. Harmonium. A kind of musical instrument. A reed organ. Log. The detailed record of a ship's voyage kept by the first mate. But some of the most important items were missing from the Mary Celeste. Where is the chronometer? asked Wright. DeVoe added, and where the sextant? navigation book, and ship's register. They both knew a ship would never sail without these. Had the captain taken them with him when he left? Then why had the family not taken their clothes or the captain's wife her jewelry? The two men asked themselves these questions. There was nothing to eat or drink in the captain's cabin, so the sailors checked in the ship's galley and pantry. There they found a six-month supply of uncooked food and fresh water. They checked the crew's quarters, which were in good order, except that there was no crew anywhere to be found. DeVoe checked the ship's galley, the kitchen, and found all the kettles, pots, and utensils washed up. There was a barrel of flour about two-thirds full. No cooked food was visible. The hold had enough food for the crew for at least six months, including meat and potatoes. It looked as if nothing was out of place or had been taken. I found DeVoe later testified in court, no wine, beer, or spirits, whatever in the ship. Chronometer, a very accurate ship's clock, not affected by motion or weather. Sextant, an instrument used by sailors to navigate by the stars. Navigation book. A book that includes tables and calculations to help sailors find their way at sea or navigate using mathematics. Register. 
the ship's official written documentation that describes its specifications and lists its owners. The last place the men looked was in the ship's hold, where her cargo, 1,700 barrels of raw alcohol, was well stowed. Not a single barrel had been opened. All in all, DeVoe and Wright looked around the Mary Celeste for over half an hour. They found no sign of anyone on board, no signs of struggle. The cargo was alcohol stored in red oak barrels. Red oak is a porous wood that lets alcohol fumes escape. When the barrels were examined, some of the alcohol was found to be gone, but that was entirely due to evaporation. According to reports, the barrels were in good order and not in any way injured. Besides, the alcohol was raw alcohol, which was to be used in fortifying Italian wines. Anyone drinking it unprocessed would not become drunk, but would rather lapse into a coma or die. Only one hatch was found open, but there was no sign of smoke damage or an explosion in the unventilated hold. Hold the area inside the ship where cargo is stored. Cargo. The goods being transported by the ship. The men did not speak as they rode back. But once on board the De Gratia, they had much to say. The captain listened sadly to their report, for he knew Captain Briggs and his wife, Sarah. He had even had dinner with them at the Astor House before they sailed. They had told him their two-year-old daughter, Sophia, was traveling with them but their seven-year-old son, Arthur, had been left behind to go to school. Captain Morehouse knew that Captain Briggs was a good sailor, a smart master, and fair to his crew. The men's oilskins, boots, and pipes were all left behind. The lady left her gold lockets. They went quickly, sir, said DeVoe. I do not think they meant to be gone for good. Then he added, I propose we bring the Mary Celeste in for salvage. Now, by the laws of the sea, she belongs to us. Captain Benjamin Spooner Briggs was an experienced sailor who bore the highest character for seamanship and honesty, according to the United States Consul in Gibraltar. He was born in Warren, Massachusetts in 1835. 
the second of five sons of Captain Nathan Briggs, all of whom but one became sailors. They followed their father's strict rule, no grog, drinking liquor, aboard ship. Captain Benjamin Briggs was a Bible reader and at 27 had married his childhood sweetheart, Sarah Cobb. They spent their honeymoon on board a ship he commanded. When they sailed on the Mary Celeste, they left behind their son Arthur, age 7, who was starting school. Sophia Matilda, age two, came with them. Oil skins. Rain gear consisting of waterproof coat, pants, and sometimes a hat. Salvage. Rescue of a wrecked or damaged ship or its cargo. November 4th, Captain Briggs and Captain Morehouse dine together in New York. November 5th, Mary Celeste leaves New York port in bad weather. November 5th through 7th. Mary Celeste at anchor about one mile offshore. November 7th. Mary Celeste sets sail, wind light and favorable. November 15th. De Gratia sets sail from New York port. November 25th. Final log entry of the Mary Celeste says the ship was six miles from the island of Santa Maria. December 4th. De Gratia sailors spy the Mary Celeste 600 miles west of Portugal. Captain Morehouse thought about salvaging the boat. It will be dangerous for both ships. Our crew is small. I cannot spare more than three men. DeVoe nodded. I can manage, sir, he said. DeVoe took only two sailors, a small boat, a barometer, a compass, and a watch and rode back across to the silent ship. It took them several days to make the Mary Celeste seaworthy again, pumping out the small amount of water and fixing the sails and masts. Then they sailed her to Gibraltar, where Captain Morehouse and his crew had to defend their rights to the ship at a long and difficult salvage trial. That trial was big news, reported in all the penny papers of the day. The barrels of alcohol were worth $37,000. The ship carried insurance on the freight of $3,400.
The ship itself was insured for $14,000. Morehouse expected that he and his crew would get about half that amount for bringing the ship into port. Salvage money is payment from the insurers and the owners of the freight, who are, in a way, buying back the ship and cargo from those who found the derelict. They actually got only a fifth, and out of it had to pay all court costs. Barometer an instrument used to determine the air's pressure and the weather. Seaworthy, in a fit state for sea voyage. Mass. Long, upright pole attached to the ship's deck that supports the sails. Penny Papers The old name for tabloid newspapers because long ago they sold for a penny. The newsboys on the streets called out the latest gossip. Bloody sword found on Mary Celeste. Planks and splinters from a fight. Half-eaten breakfast still on the table. Thirteen missing from cursed ship. Readers thrilled to these stories, but some were half-truths, and some were downright lies. The only people who knew what really happened on the Mary Celeste after the last log entry had been written were the ten people on board. They could have told the real story if they were ever found. They never were. The yellow journals, like the tabloids today, sometimes made up stories instead of just reporting actual facts. Some said the ship's cat was asleep when DeVoe found him. There was no cat. Some said the food was still warm on the stove. The ship's log indicated people had been last aboard November 25th, 10 days earlier. Some said the captain's watch was still ticking on a nail. This would have been a daily wind-up watch. Some said that the ship carried 13 people, a cursed number. There were 10, including the captain and his wife and child. Such details make for better gossip, better stories but they are simply not true. So what did happen? My dad says no one knows for sure, but now that you have read the story and have studied my notes, map, timeline, and word list, maybe you can solve the mystery of the Mary Celeste. Perhaps you will think one of the old theories of how things really happen. Or maybe you'll come up with a theory of your own. Only remember, as my dad always says, check your clues. 
One, the pirate theory. The Mary Celeste was set upon by pirates and the crew was murdered or put overboard in a lifeboat. Were there any signs of a fight? What valuables were missing? What valuables remained on the ship? What was more valuable than the ship itself? Two, the drunken crew theory. The crew of the Mary Celeste got drunk and killed the captain and his family. Then they fled in the lifeboat. What kind of a man was Captain Briggs? What kind of alcohol was aboard? Was any alcohol missing? What valuables were gone? Why didn't the crew keep the ship? Three, the frightened crew theory. The captain and crew were frightened by smoke and fumes escaping from the alcohol. They waited in the lifeboat to see if the Mary Celeste was going to explode. For reasons unknown, they were never able to return to the ship. Was there evidence of smoke and fumes? What kind of sailor was Captain Briggs? Were the hatches blown? Was there evidence of fire on board? The weather theories. Bad weather, whirlpools, even icebergs were said to have damaged the Mary Celeste or frightened the crew into abandoning ship. What did the ship's log say about weather? What kind of a sailor was Captain Briggs? Was the ship damaged? Five, the sea monster theory. A hundred years ago, there were still people who believed that a sea monster like a kraken or giant octopus, had somehow devoured the crew. Is there any credible biological evidence of sea serpents or sea monsters? Were there any marks of any such struggle on the ship? The De Gratia Conspiracy Theory Captain Morehouse and his crew, the only eyewitnesses to the mystery scene, had more to do with the disappearance than they were telling. Perhaps they were the ones who had disposed of the Mary Celeste crew. Or perhaps Captain Morehouse had conspired with Captain Briggs over dinner the night before the Mary Celeste sailed, planning the abandonment. What family did Captain Briggs leave behind? What kind of money would have to be involved? How respectable were the two captains?
Those are the six most popular explanations ever given. Are any of them right? Nobody knows for sure. Not the police, not the lawyers, not the reporters, not the historians, and not even my dad. It is a mystery still waiting to be solved. It is, as my dad says, an open file. But I've got my own theory about what happened to the Mary Celeste crew. And maybe, now, you do too.